Welcome, dear colleagues. I'm happy to see you all here today. Yeah, a lot of people already, so we're about to start. Hello, everybody. So uh, if you can hear me well, can you just put a plus in the chat? Yay, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, at least some people can hear me, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so welcome to the webinar. My name is Kisilova Evgenia and I'm Cambridge Assessment English Methodologist. And today we're going to have a webinar about young learners' qualifications and we're going to talk about vocabulary, how to teach it, why to teach it and, well, uh, what to teach also. Uh, okay, so just some technical... Uh, peculiarities. So uh, you have a special chat for questions. Please uh, pay attention you, and uh, write your questions there, not in the general chat, just because I might miss some of them. And I'm going to answer them uh, closer to the end of the webinar. Also, concerning, uh, you usually have a lot of questions concerning the materials, the certificates, and uh, the videos. So you are getting it um, probably tomorrow or on Monday. You will get all the certificates, all the materials, the videos, and, well, everything that was promised. So, I guess we have a lot of people, yeah, so um, I suppose we should start now. Well, today we're going to talk about young learners' qualifications, and that would be pre-A1 starters, A1 movers, and A2 flyers. And if you have a look at the next slide, you can see that uh, we start our way to C2 proficiency from a very low level and these three exams are aimed at uh, students who are about from 6, 7 to 12 years old and uh, this is very important for us as teachers because we need to know the peculiarities and we need to know the characteristics of this age group. So uh, that's why at this webinar we are going to have an overview of the required vocabulary. We're going to have a look at some tasks, some formats, uh, see what the focus of the tasks is and why we need vocabulary for these particular tasks. We will talk about the characteristics of this age group. So have a look at who are our young learners, what can they do, what can't they do and what are we supposed to do with them. Also, we will talk about planning a bit, how to integrate the vocabulary teaching into the lesson plan, how to make it effective, uh, how to make it less, um, let's say, boring, because sometimes some students say, oh, I don't want to study these, these words, it's too boring, let's play games. So we're going to talk about all of these things. Well, so when we speak about these three exams, these three qualifications, we know that um, we teach and we expect them to demonstrate all four skills. That would be listening, speaking and reading, writing combined. And at each step of this way, they have to demonstrate how well they know the vocabulary, how can they manipulate this vocabulary, how they can um, produce it and uh, receive it, so, and what can they do. Uh, and yeah, I, I will repeat it that they will need uh, good knowledge of vocabulary at every step of their way and for each type of skill they are uh, expected to demonstrate. So uh, let's have a look at some tasks that our students have during the exam. Uh, uh, here you can see the starters part one and uh, what they are supposed to do. They're only supposed to recognize the word, uh, to uh, look at the picture and uh, have this association whether this is the correct one or not. So they need to be able to recognize the written form. They need to be able to recognize the visual. So there's a lot of support and this task only requires uh, them just to know the written form basically. But if we have a look at the Movers and Flyers, part one, we can see that it's a more complex task where they not only have to know the words, uh, the vocabulary items, but also they will have to know, they should know, um, and expect, are expected to know the definitions of these words. And if you've uh, 
probably um, noticed the previous task for starters, they only had visuals and short sentences. Now, uh, at, uh, for movers, which is on the right part of the screen, you can see that they have both visual support, they have the word, and they have the definition. So a lot, uh, they are expected to demonstrate more developed cognitive skills, uh, analytical skills here, and they, of course, have to know the vocab. As for flyers, you can see that no visuals here, so less support for them, and more extra words, more distractors that they have here, and uh, the definitions are much, much longer. But again, they have to be able to recognize the written form, they have to be able to pronounce it in their head, and they have to be able to associate the word with the definition. So again, a lot of vocabulary work, uh, a lot of pre-teaching from, from Moss, from their teachers. Well, the next uh, is going to be speaking part already. Again, vocabulary. Uh, what they're supposed to do, they have a big scene picture, and not only they have to recognize the object, they have to recognize the, uh, the, the way the word sounds, because it's the examiner who asks them to point at something. They have to be able to know, uh, to name the objects, and also give some short information about that. So again, they have an object, they need to be able to describe and produce some relevant vocabulary. Uh, for starters, that would be some simple basic things like colors, um, size, shape, um, that is probably all. We're not going to look at all the tasks in the exam, just some of them which are different and where the um, vocab is the main focus of the task. And again, for speaking, here you can see movers and flyers. And this particular one is flyers because the vocabulary needed here is much more difficult and uh, a lot more details than for movers, for example. Uh, so if you compare the first task for, of speaking part for starters and the first part for, of speaking task for movers, speaking part, I'm sorry, uh, and flyers, you can see that the level of vocabulary should be much higher and they have to know their language resource has to be much wider. So again, name subjects, uh, some objects, I beg your pardon, listen to the examiner, identify the differences, so the main focus is vocabulary again. Hmm. The next one, even more cognitive, well-developed cognitive skills here, because three pictures, all of them are to some extent similar, but have some differences. So, again, a lot of vocabulary, they have to be able to listen and identify. The difficulty here is that it's not speaking where they have uh, some prompts from the examiner. So, uh, they can uh, only listen to it twice, but they can't ask for repetition and they can't ask for any help. So, um, it's a more complex task here, and again, they need vocabulary. Hmm. And one, uh, well, another task, which is a bit different from the others, uh, they need vocabulary for um, defending their point of view. They need vocabulary for uh, justifying their opinion and uh, some words to express their ideas, like um, describe the objects, explain why something is different. So uh, this is probably one of the most difficult tasks because they have to produce their own ideas. Uh, it's the movers speaking part. So for all these tasks, our students need uh, a lot of vocabulary and it, we as teachers have to find out how to deal with that. Uh, so yeah, the last one would be uh, the written part, an example of a writing where they have to identify not only, you see the level of complexity, yeah? So first, just recognition, then they have to uh, recognize the word and produce something. And here they have to recognize not only the meaning of the word, but they have to recognize whether the word fits grammatically and lexically, because um, there are different parts of speech 
and it has to be logical and it has to be correct. So this is uh, one of uh, the tasks where the number of skills is um, higher than the others. So when we start preparing our students for um, for the exams and when we start teaching the vocabulary or any other uh, system, we should uh, definitely uh, think about what characteristics this age group has. So I've got here eight of them and some of them are complete, but can you guess the first three and number six, please? So all of them describe who are young learners. So safe uh-huh all right mm -hmm. limited life experience mm -hmm. anything else lexical uh i'm not sure we have lexical somewhere because support all right, so the number of these uh, dashes is exactly the number of the letters in the word. So I'm, I'm afraid support doesn't fit. So we can't squeeze it into four letters. Well. Safe, yeah, safe, definitely. Language experience, uh-huh. Language, life, okay. Something with competence. Is this the one you're struggling with? <laughs> okay, no more ideas? Now let's try to look at the answers. <laughs> well done with learning experience, well done Linguistic competence, yes, super. Life experience, yes. All right, let's talk about all of them. Why are they so important? If they have limited learning experience, it means that uh, they don't know what to do. We have to teach them strategies and we teach them uh, how to approach the task, uh, how to deal with it, what to do with the task, because uh, in most cases, um, they are not experienced like exam takers and uh, they don't uh, basically know, uh, they just start doing some random things. And that's why they have to know the format and that's why they have to know what to start with. If we speak about limited life experience, it means that uh, your task has to be, has to be uh, within a context. Otherwise, if you start talking uh, about some things which are not authentic for this age group, they will probably just zone out because I can't imagine a 10-year-old uh, listening for a text about um, nuclear power, for example. So it has to be authentic and it has to be relevant to their life experience, which is quite relevant. So what do you think is the most uh, authentic for students who are like seven, eight, nine years old? Uh, authentic for their life experience. What type of material? Animals, okay. Mm -hmm. F food, <laughs> school, family, games, exactly. Activity, uh huh. Toys, nature. Well, I, I would take it as animals and some plants. Weather. Mm -hmm. So all, all the points that are um, included into the exam. School. Yeah. Well. Some of them just don't like it yet, but means of transport. So a lot of things, yeah, which are uh, within their um, within their comfort zone, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. So if we speak about limited linguistic competence, so here we would mean that our students don't have, especially at the lower levels for like pre-A1 or A2 movers, um, they're linguistic resource is quite uh, limited 
And this is our task to teach them and to give as many as they can take, but not too many. Again, there should be a balance. What else I meant when I had this linguist, limited linguistic competence here? Uh, that our students, especially at the lower levels, especially starters, they have no idea about any grammar constructions. They have no idea of what a subject or an attribute is. Um, and I don't think they should. That's why vocabulary here works as uh, has the grammar grammatical role too, because they remember all our phrases and chunks, and they don't know uh, whether they, they use the correct auxiliary or not. So this is why vocabulary is so important for the lower levels. And we're going to talk about how to use this feature. So love playing with the language. Do it. I hope your students do the same. When they hear some word, they kind of taste it and feel it. And they try to use it when uh, they see the appropriate context for that. And sometimes they create their own words. So they take the uh, stem of the word and they use it uh, in a different situation. And they use it as uh, with some Russian prefixes or suffixes. So this is when they start uh, feeling it and they start manipulating with it. And I actually find it to be a really beautiful thing. Uh, the next one, they are quite visual and kinesthetic. So a lot of visual support when you're teaching vocabulary and a lot of movement, please. A lot of realia, a lot of objects they can touch, they can uh, physically, mm, I don't know, accept. Probably. So they need safe environment. I hope, um, it, well, it is quite clear what safe environment is. It's not only that you don't have some sharp angles, your furniture doesn't have any uh, uh, sharp corners, uh, but it's when your students are not afraid of making mistakes. And it's very, very closely related to the playing with language. So when they are not afraid of making a mistake, when they are not afraid of saying something wrong, they start manipulating uh, the items, they start using it. Short attention span, the next one we have here. So that would be important for us just for the classroom management. So change the activities, even if you're working with only 10 uh, vocabulary items, Every five, four minutes, do something different and they will remember it better. And the last one I think is quite self-explanatory. So you love playing, they love playing, they do. And uh, why not let them do that? Okay, so all these characteristics uh, we need to consider while we're uh, trying to achieve our aims in teaching. And our aims would be for the effective preparation is that our students should be able to understand how words function in the language. Remember, uh, they have to complete some gaps in the text, they have to um, use the appropriate form, so whether it's an adjective or whether it's a noun, even though they don't know these concepts. They have to be able to understand and notice the, uh, their familiar words. So all the words which you have in the vocabulary list should be familiar to them because they won't get anything unknown, only the words uh, that are provided by the handbook. Well, um, they need to be able to use the context. Remember I told you, not much learning experience, not much life experience, but you have to be able to create the context for them and they should be able to create this context for them during the exam. So there are a lot of things that help uh, doing that, but uh, still your students have to um, be able to activate their background knowledge when they see a picture, for example, and manipulating the language, actually using the words. So let's see how we do that. Uh, I'm pretty sure we all do that, and you know, but probably don't, uh, we do it subconsciously. There are two ways of teaching, not only vocabulary, but anything else. And one of them is formal. When we write our lesson plans, when we specifically teach some vocabulary items uh, and we do things on purpose, it's on the plan and informal.
because we all as teachers have some words that we use all the time. Um, you know, my students starting from like five years, when they're five years old, they listen to me and they start using words like seriously. So can you imagine a five year old with this face saying seriously? Because this is what I use informally. This is what I use not, I, I'm not trying to teach it. But I just react and I do it like um, naturally. And that's why they start doing the same. Yeah, I give some instructions and they remember it. And they repeat it when I say, if we speak about le young learners. I say superstars. Yeah, come, come on, yeah. <laughs> yes, they do say come on. Mm -hmm. True, we we'll probably have the same students. Um, praise, I praise them a lot. I say, yeah, superstar is lovely, awesome. Can you guess what they, uh, what I get in return? They say, yeah, Jane, superstar. Thank you very much. So this is what happens, uh, uh, this is the informal teaching. And a lot of vocabulary is also taught this way. So probably we should, uh, Wonderful. <laughs> okay, so uh, we should um, we should be aware of what we are saying during the lesson, of course. But uh, if you want them to remember some phrases, some chunks, which can help them for the uh, I don't know for the speaking task, for example, like sorry, can you repeat that? Or sorry, I don't understand. So this is what you should use because. Also, they accept it as vocabulary, I mean, our students. And this is something we can do without even, um, well, a lot of uh, effort from our point. Okay, what else is important for young learners? Remember about the safe environment. They feel safe when they know what's going to happen. They feel safe when they know what they are supposed to do. And when they feel safe, they, their production is much, much better. So for young learners, routines, routine is the key. Uh, apart from revising, recycling, and reviewing their vocabulary, I can suggest such a thing as an enter the room word. So when your students, I don't know how many students you teach, um, but you might want to try this. Before opening the door for the students, before they enter the classroom, Ask them for the word from the uh, last lesson or any lesson or any word you would like to revise. Show them a flashcard. If you use uh, L1, ask them to translate. And only after that, they can enter the room. The same with leave the room word. It's very helpful for recycling the vocabulary because again, you can't leave the room until you tell me the word. The same flashcards or whatever you have there. Uh, with my students, we usually choose word of the day. They tend to uh, to opt for something funny, and usually uh, the word is funny either because it sounds funny, it's similar to Russian, uh, some Russian word, or it's a long word which they can't pronounce. Guess what? We choose it uh, as a word of the day, we pronounce it several times, and they remember it, even though it caused some problems at the very beginning of the lesson. Uh, I've already mentioned things about the classroom language, that this is what you use. And uh, also there is one thing that um, you might already do. Uh, and what I suggest uh, is that you have, to be, be, you have to be consistent with that because vocabulary book really help. Uh, books really help. They can have some simple notebooks or as you can see from this picture, I'm a big fan of mini books. They can create these mini books themselves. And uh, this mini book was created by one of my students. So it's about hobbies and different activities. So there was cooking, playing the piano, uh, jumping the rope, as far as I remember. And they have these mini books. They use it. And for each topic, we have a separate books. Very helpful in case you want to revise something. You can have a small library with these books and what my students do when I ask them a question like what's your favorite food today or what did you eat yesterday they run to this uh, library take a book and look for something <gasps> yeah teacher I found this word look I'm very clever so 
they make it themselves and they use it because it's like hmm, my book okay speaking about the topics that uh, we expect our students to know before taking the exam all of them can be found in the handbook all of them can be found uh, uh, on the website so these are the topics here so all levels have to know these movers you also uh, add health and more numbers and for flyers there would be materials so the word lists can be found they are not secret and your students are supposed to know them well let's move to the fun part so how do we teach vocabulary some techniques and some ideas and um, what can we do with it well when we speak about vocabulary we mean a collection of words that an individual knows so this is a definition by Jane Willis uh, the founder of uh, the task-based learning and what our individual what do our young learners know Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, they know, um, they usually remember the vocabulary as a chain of associations. And that's why I would suggest, I would suggest using a topic-based approach to teaching vocabulary. So what is a topic-based approach? This is when you plan your lesson around uh, some topic like animals and you take all the vocabulary connected to this topic you take all the collocations connected to this topic and as a result your students have a contextualized vocabulary item or items and actually this is what most modern books do now and if you take some books by Cambridge, like uh, Superminds, for example, or Kids Box, you can see that usually this is the topic-based approach. So uh, why is it good for our children? Because first of all, context. They feel safe, they have the context. Uh, it works for their limited life experience. Yeah, Kids Box is great, I love it. Um, what else? Some students are not very good at English, not a secret, unfortunately, but they might be really good at um, some uh, low level biology and they know a lot of animals or they might be really interested in weather. They know something about it or they go to holidays like every three weeks and they can talk about holiday activities. And so you can connect their knowledge of this world with your English and you can build your lesson around this knowledge and they will be your source of vocabulary so you can elicit a lot from them and again connected to the real world connected to what they already know okay uh, there are some prints not wouldn't call them principles there are some activities um, some techniques which are used within this topic-based approach and I would like you to have a look at the next slide unfortunately they're a bit scrambled so can I ask you to unscramble these techniques and see what we get how can we organize this uh, vocabulary associations uh-huh okay the most difficult one, well done. Mind maps, mm-hmm. Mind map, mm-hmm. Categorizing, okay. Cause and effect. Okay, let's see. So, categorizing, well done. Ordering, creating associations. I'm not sure, yeah, Venn diagrams. Well done with Venn diagrams. Mind maps, cause and effect. So I'm sure you use at least some of them, maybe all of them, I don't know. So let's have a closer look at how we can use these techniques and uh, what can we do with them for uh, exam preparation. Come on, uh-huh. Right, so the first one would be creating associations. Uh, so works really well with all levels, even with uh, advanced. 
So you have some visual or you have a word. You write, it looks like, might look like a mind map uh, if you want. Um, I prefer this one. And uh, you write down some associations with this word. Helps them create the context and helps them uh, remember the word better. So we're going to carry out a little experiment and see how it works. What I'd like you to do, uh, if you could find some piece of paper or somewhere to write and uh, a pencil or a pen, because I would like you to write something. I hope you have something to write with. Some place, I don't know, use your telephone. Yes, at least one person. So you're going to be our guinea pig today. <laughs> so I will show you a word. Of course, it's not something very easy, very basic like grapes, because we are definitely uh, teachers and we have uh, a level which is not. A1 or A2, and I would like you to write down some associations with this word, but you shouldn't write down the word itself. So just the associations, and we'll see how it works. So this is a word. In case you don't know it, so uh, Sing song means it usually is um, about, uh, it's a description of a person's voice. It's usually monotonous and this voice has a repeated um, rising and falling rhythm. So this is, uh, can you think of any examples why we can use a sing song voice? When can we use it? Like, Rising and falling rhythm, monotonous, usually quite gentle. Lecture. <laughs> we might. Okay. And anything else? Pre wow. <laughs> Choir. So when you are singing, mm -hmm. story, concert. Okay. <laughs> nice. Actress. Well done. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, that's exactly putting kids to bed. <laughs> this is when I use my sing song voice when I ask, when I'm trying to persuade my kid to start sleeping at last. <clears throat> and of course, I don't sound like, like I sound now. So, um, this sing song voice, yeah, or just sing song, please write down four or five associations with it just for you your associations don't write the word sing song only the associations i'll give you half a minute to do that only the associations not the word <laughs> Okay, so I hope you have your associations. And now I would like you to move on and to think about some completely different thing because we're going to check whether you remember the word or not closer to the end of this webinar. So don't write it down yet. Okay, so let's move on. Well, one of the techniques that I have mentioned was mind maps, and I'm sure we all use it. Um, so oh, we simply have one concept and all the, again, associations with it, or it can be some adjectives that we need, can be um, nouns, whatever we find appropriate. So in my case, this is the weather. The next type of... Uh, technique is cause and effect and in this case this is more probably uh, well, this particular one is probably more appropriate for flyers because we already have some collocations like catch a cold and we can see that uh, 
again, we're creating some context. When it's raining, we need to have an umbrella, rubber boots, uh, it's cloudy, and after it, we have rainbow. So not that obvious, but also might uh, exist. So this is the cause and effect one. So can you think of any other cause and effect examples of vocabulary that you have recently taught? Anything. Chocolate, happy mood. <laughs> I would say chocolate uh, and then some overweight person, but happy mood is much better. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at the next slide. Illness, chocolate illness. Breakfast, not hungry, go to... <laughs> yeah, okay. Cause and effect. If you have breakfast, you have to go to school, even if it's the weekend, of course. All right, categorizing. Uh, this was taken from one of the fun for... I'm not sure. I think it was fun for movers book. Don't really remember, sorry. So this is when we have to put uh, things into different categories. So you either have the words... Uh, which are already prepared for them, or you can just give them the categories and ask them to complete and make a competition out of it. So also possible. If you use some realia, you can ask them to sort uh, sort out some uh, package of different things. For example, when you have uh, um, when you're talking about materials and you're talking about uh, environment, it's a good idea. Just uh huh. Yes, 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 movers, thank you. Uh, once, for example, I had uh, a lesson when we were talking about environment and I actually brought a bag of trash to my uh, classroom. It wasn't real trash, of course, but we had to sort it out. So we had some uh, rubber, it was flyers, we had some uh, plastic things, so things like that, a lot of realia. They were really happy to sort out my trash for some reason, I don't know, and we learned a lot of words. So it can be just writing or you can make it, uh, turn it into some kind of a, um, kind of a game. So, uh, ordering. Uh, when we talk about ordering something, uh, it's uh, usually uh, a technique when we describe a process when uh, we start, like in this example, we start with uh, some grass and then all the chain that follows. There's a cow which eats the grass, then it gives us milk and then there is a happy person. So a lot of vocabulary also uh, here that we can use. And again, remember we, uh, we were talking about some um, knowledge from other subjects. So it helps when you start ordering things. So it helps when you start talking about the process. Yeah, because some students may know more than others. Okay. The last, uh, the, the next one would be Venn diagram. So uh, we have a turtle and an elephant. And we have two circles. So one for each. And here in the middle, we have features that connect them both. So a turtle is small, can swim and lives in, in water. And uh, an elephant is big, can run and lives on the land. But they both have a short tail, four legs, and they both can't jump. Well, at least as far as I know. So, uh, so you can use any animals or you can use any concepts. And it's also very visual. And what's more, it's not only uh, the vocabulary that you provide, but you take it from the students. So do you think they have something else in common, a turtle and an elephant? Maybe you have some more ideas. What are the similarities between a turtle and an elephant? Ha oh. Hard. I haven't thought of that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, they probably do. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
Uh-huh. Uh, I'm not sure about the turtle, but I'll probably have to check it. I used to think it eats fish. Very calm. Uh, <laughs> yes. Gray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lovely. Especially my elephant, which is a bit purplish, but yes. Thank you. So this is what you, happens when you start talking to your students and they give you a lot of ideas. They can. Well, it's uh, a, just a version of a Venn diagram. Again, I have some uh, land and water animals and some animals that can live both on the land and in the water. So this one was created by my students. I couldn't think of anything else here. But uh, it's also, but here in this case, it's more about visuals. So it works more for the lower levels. Okay. Uh, what else I find really helpful when you're teaching vocabulary is that all the vocabulary that you teach should stay in the classroom. Because uh, if you just talk about some words and then forget about them and they are somewhere at the beginning of the book, your students won't probably ever go back there. They will forget about it because, well, we've learned it, let's forget about it. But what I suggest is that we can put all these words on the walls if you have a classroom. For example, um, this holidays thing is called a word wall. This is actually um, a wall from my classroom. And when we were talking about holidays, I uh, asked them for some words which they associate with holidays. And it's still there and they use it, um, they refer to this uh, word wall and they look at the spelling because spelling is also crucial at some tasks and uh, they revise and recycle this vocabulary all the time again and again. Uh, what you can see on, you, on the right is a page from a book published by Cambridge and here again you can see a picture and you can see some words which describe the picture. It's also helpful if you have some kind of a poster like that and you put it on the wall because your students, this would be the informal part of teaching. When you do it on, not, don't do it on purpose, but you ask them some questions, I don't know, at the beginning of the lesson and they want, they really want to look clever and they would look around to find something that is relevant and uh, to show that, yeah, I, I, I'm the good student, I know this posh word, I know like waterfall for example. So uh, this is the informal learning that I've already mentioned and this is uh, a lot of uh, like extra exposure to the language. So uh, I would suggest a lesson plan uh, for teaching vocabulary um, it can be your main aim or it can be just a part of your lesson, I don't know, depends on you and it depends on um, the, um, I don't know, the, the outcomes you want to have after the lesson. So uh, I suggest a plan which would consist of three parts. There would be the pre-teaching, the controlled practice and free practice. And if you have a quick look at it, does it uh, probably remind you of any uh, teaching framework that we have for, for adults and for teenagers? What teaching framework is that? Lesson framework. Okay, yeah, this is exactly what I mean. Yeah, that's PPP, exactly. So that would be the presentation part, the pre-teaching, that would be our practice. Yeah, controlled practice in our case and free practice production that we uh, expect from them. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so when we speak about the pre-teaching, remember, again, let's go back so we have to give them context not just random words that are thrown at them. 
uh, but the context uh, because they they are limited life experience they are limited learning experience we have to activate the background knowledge and that would make uh, the lesson um, the, the learning process easier for them so personal stories work here a lot of visuals it doesn't matter if you're teaching starters or it's flyers a lot of visuals work so you show them flashcards posters uh, some short videos whatever you might find uh, helpful when we're speaking about the controlled practice stage uh, we would start with the combination of an image and a, the sound so first we should start with the uh, oral practice we should pronounce the word from the for them and show them the visual uh, because as we know uh, we accept the biggest part of information through our eyes and when they see the picture it's easier for them to associate this uh, concept and the way it sounds so again show the flashcard you should drill it uh, drill, you should name it you should drill the pronunciation corally and individually for shy students probably not from the first time yeah and after that only after drilling it and drilling and drilling and drilling again you should introduce the written form of the word because this is the stage when they already know what it sounds like they have it in their head and they are ready for the written form and after providing this written form here comes the controlled practice stage they should do something they should write it they should read it and underline they should probably complete a crossword or decipher something um, which actually works really well with all levels when they have a code and they need to guess it so why not yeah and uh, what is also important here and something that we always forget about feedback uh, we have to give them feedback on controlled practice because this is our um, one of the few chances we have to improve something before they start manipulating the language so this is our chance to improve pronunciation to pay their attention to uh, the way the word is spelled and the way the word is used whether it's used uh, as an adjective the function of the adjective or the verb the verb or a noun so we have to show them and when it comes to free practice this is the chance to manipulate this is the chance to describe something uh, I do uh, highly recommend and insist on usually a lot of visuals and a lot of scene pictures in your classroom so they are still kids and they love visual support and they need this visual support to be um, successful and during the exam they will also have a lot of pictures they'll have a lot of visuals uh, small pictures big pictures and they have to be used to that so they can describe something they can put pictures in order uh, like which is I don't know bigger smaller and something they can uh, so use some categories um, they can use some mind maps so this is the stage when they can produce something and this is the stage when you can elicit associations with the words and uh, they can also at this point um, give definitions because they will need it to for the tasks which we've uh, talked about at the very beginning of uh, the webinar so um, I'm sure you use some of these ideas already so uh, this is how we practice the vocab on the word level so there will be palmanism the memory games we love there would be the taboo game I hope you know it I'm going to talk about it a bit later just briefly that can be back to the board when they have to so like me sitting now imagine this is a board so you write a word and the whole class has to explain what the word means and I would guess it they would be the Chinese whisperer I'm sure all of us uh, played the 
so-called broken telephone. So this is the Chinese whisperer. When uh, you show them a picture or a word and they whisper it to each other and then uh, the last person will have to circle the correct spelling or well the correct word or they will have to write the word depends on what you want from them board rush works for starters when you have a big scene picture uh, like you have the vocabulary about holidays and you just ask your children to you name something some concept and ask your children to run and touch the thing so a lot of um, energy released here and you can use it if you want some uh, activity uh, to, to, I don't know, to stop them from slipping. Unscrambling, very helpful for spelling. Again, deciphering, as I've already mentioned, and matching. So all these things, if you keep repeating them, they do work. They still do work. So the taboo game, have you ever played it in some company? Oh, with your students. Yay. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, if you say yes and sure, can you tell me what level did you play with? Because uh, sometimes I hear that, oh, they are movers. They can't do that. Too difficult for them. Okay, from A2. Mm -hmm. uh, was it effective? Pre-int, so you don't start earlier. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, uh, sometimes... Honestly, to C2, not just to C1. Trust me, it works. Okay, so um, if you know this game, well done. If you don't, you have a description here. And uh, you can you will get the presentation, you can read it and try. So this particular picture, uh, this, this is a photo of, um, one, of my, um, one of my students. They, uh, so a group, they played uh, this game and this is actually movers. So it's the beginning of movers and they have the word and they have the explanation for that. So it does work, probably not for starters, but for movers, perfectly well. And uh, suffer, oh, why not? I mean, they can suffer a little if it gives the result. <laughs> okay, so you might try it. If you think that it's not appropriate for your students, you know your students better, of course. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But why not try? Because it's a very good uh, preparation thing for the definition tasks for movers and flyers. Yeah, it does. Well, speaking about uh, more information uh, about the qualifications, about the materials, I'm pretty sure you will get some materials and some links uh, in the palms. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so if you go to this website, www.cambridgeenglish.org, you will find all the materials there. You will find some videos for preparation. You will find the handbooks, the word lists, the vocabulary and grammar lists. You will find um, everything you need and even more than you probably have even dreamt of. So I do recommend going there and trying it. So do you have any questions? It can be about vocabulary or, I don't know, just uh, exam preparation, any other skills that you might be interested in? Anything? Well, I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Okay. You're very, very welcome. And I hope it, it will make your preparation process easier and more effective. Handbooks that could help ass assess practice. I'm not sure what you mean. 
handbooks that could help assess practice tests. What would that be? What do you mean? Uh, if you're talking about some samples, uh, handbooks for all exams, well, handbooks can help, and you have practice tests, you have samples, you have uh, books with tests, like from some previous uh, years. Um, try it. Yeah. Mock exams. Criteria, I don't really... Well, the, all the criteria, the assessment criteria are in the handbooks. So you can find it there. Uh, I would recommend not only looking at the criteria, but only look at the description of the criteria because sometimes it's, it can be confusing. Oh, how many points? Well, I'm afraid I can't help you with that. So it's, it's only uh, in the criteria. You can um, have a look there and see how many points you can give uh, for like... Uh, the production, like speaking or writing. It is actually given there and the description. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you very much for being here today with me. And I wish you all um, <laughs> an easy and effective and pleasant preparation process and good students. Uh, yeah, just, just a second. And uh, just um, I want to remind you that all the videos and all the materials will be sent to you will either tomorrow or on Monday. So you will get everything, the certificates and the videos and the materials. And also, as far as I know, uh, you will have um, in the materials, you will have attached um, all the reference books that I used for preparation and that I might recommend for uh, reading uh, if you're teaching young learners. Uh, speaking about webinars, of course, there are going to be some more webinars and uh, you just have to, um, so I'm, I'm sure they, uh, Cambridge Assessments will send you a link and an invitation if there are more webinars like that. And uh, we had a webinar on Tuesday, so you, you've probably missed it, I don't know, but uh, I think it's also going to be sent to you. So. Okay. Thank you very much for being here today. So good luck with your preparation. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.